Tom's River took a big hit in the hurricane, but years ago it made headlines when a local cancer epidemic was linked to chemical waste. It's a story told by the award-winning journalist and professor Dan Fagan in his new book entitled Tom's River, A Story of Science and Salvation. He joins us now. Welcome. Thanks. The story begins where? With some chemical companies that decide to use the river as a toilet, essentially? Right. Well, it, I mean, if we really want to talk about where this story starts, you know, we could, we could start it in, in the mid-1800s uh, when the synthetic chemical industry was born. But... The story in Tom's River begins in the 1950s when uh, Siba, a very large Swiss-based chemical company, decides to build a dye plant in Tom's River after almost a century of difficulties manufacturing elsewhere. And suddenly a couple of uh, decades pass and people start coming down with the kind of cancers that are not supposed to be seen, especially in children. Right. Um, it's not that the cancers themselves are never seen in children, it's that just that there are an unusual number of them. And uh, people started to notice that and ask questions, and they were repeatedly told, don't worry about it, it's nothing. Who was telling them don't worry about it? Well, various people. Uh, you know, the, the State Department of Health eventually became a real positive force in this story, but early on they were not very responsive to citizen complaints. There was a nurse at the Philadelphia, uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She noticed this, and the the physicians at CHOP, as that hospital mm -hmm. is told, told her, well, it's just all in your imagination. Uh, but she refused to uh, just blow it off. She, she thought something real was happening. And, and that's really been this, the pattern in Tom's River, that individuals really spoke up at key moments, and eventually things came to light that one would expect would never come to light. So, and then it goes from coming to light to going into the courtrooms? Well, it never actually went to court. Uh, it was a very interesting process. Uh, uh, Jan Schlickman, who some of your viewers will know as the person who was uh, portrayed by John Travolta in a civil action, got involved in this case too. And Jan and the uh, local attorneys based in Philadelphia all thought that they wanted to avoid the kind of multi-year fiasco that occurred, a uh, courtroom fight that occurred in Woburn. So they did a negotiation process, process, a very unusual one, that went on for several years anyway, even though it was much faster than what would have happened had it gone to court. And it eventually ended in a settlement. Anybody that, admit guilt? Any, no. Nobody admitted culpability? No, no one admitted culpability. I mean, it, that's, that's the nature of these settlements. Conditions there now? Uh, Tom's River, there's no reason to think that the air or the water in Tom's River is, is any worse than generally in, in the region. So it's uh, been remediated, as they say? Yeah, it's almost completely remediated. There are still things going on. There, there, will be, there are billions of gallons of tainted groundwater beneath that factory site, and that pumping is, is still going on and will go on for at least another 12 years. There's one landfill that's not, hasn't been completely cleaned out, but it's a lined landfill. So certainly people are paying so much attention to the Toms River environment that there's no reason that people should be particularly concerned in Tom's River right now. That's not why I wrote this book. Part of it, as I understand it, was as a cautionary tale. Yeah. Because that, what has happened there is still going on elsewhere. Yeah, that's really the point, that, that Tom's River, I wanted to tell this story and put it in the broader context of epidemiology, you know, which is patterns of illness and how do we know what we know about the relationship between cancer and the environment because sadly the Tom's River story keeps repeating. The Tom's River story was itself a repeat of similar stories that occurred first in Europe and Ohio and other places. And then the chemical manufacturers moved on to the south, to Alabama, Mississippi, then overseas. And what I'm really concerned about right now is uh, China, which is now the absolute dominant force in, uh, manu in chemical manufacturing. And, you know, there are reasons why the companies are there now. It's not just because labor's cheap. It's also because regulation is they very get weak. get away with it. Well, yeah. this, it's a great read, a cautionary tale, and a story that strikes at the heart of all New Jerseyans, but basically anybody who lives anywhere where stuff is being made. Uh, we appreciate you coming in. Dan Fagan. It's a pleasure. Thanks Thank a lot.